Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to another episode. Today's episode of Locked On Canucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. My name is Nick Bondi. You can follow me at Nick Bondi on Twitter. I'm with my, as always, brilliant co-host, Lachlan Irvin. You can find him on Twitter at Lock in the Crease. Lachlan, how are we doing today? Another day, uh, another day closer to the start of the NHL regular season. Yeah, another day closer. Still no contracts for uh, Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes, but uh, we're getting closer to seeing uh, a little bit of what the final team looks like. We're getting a better glimpse into uh, what the coaching staff feels like their their roster is going forward. You're seeing a lot more practices involving more of the uh, the main group, and um, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about that today. We're going to I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about uh, the fact that yeah, we're getting we're getting we're getting dangerously close to the regular season uh, without with very little information on what's going on with their two best players and the contract situation they have out there. Yeah, so uh, we'll, of course, get into that. But first, we'll start with the uh, what we can glean, I guess, from Wednesday's practice lines with uh, the main group, as you mentioned. Of course, we'll talk about uh, Elias Patterson and Quinn Hughes. Try and see, you know, what news is out there. And we'll end with some goalie talk because I know you're a big, uh, oh, you're a big goalie guy, Lachlan. That is your personal brand, is being a goalie guy. So uh, let, let's get right into it. Uh, I think we're, we can gleam a lot into it. I think, first of all, I think, Guys like uh, G. Giuseppe and Chase on have a pretty good chance, in in, uh, in my opinion, to make this team and almost almost a lock at this point. Like you see, uh, you see uh, Alex Chase on playing with Tanner Pearson and Bo Horvat, which means he's probably going to have a good opportunity to make this team uh, as a as a PTO player, which you know doesn't happen that often. Uh, you, we have G. Giuseppe playing on the on the kind of the fourth line, I guess, with. Uh, Jason Dickinson and Zach McEwen, pretty surprising. I didn't think he had a great camp, but it seems like he's on that fourth line. Uh, Ole Olevi, our, our favorite player here on this podcast, who we've been ripping the shreds constantly for the past, uh, seems like the past week or so, uh, kind of uh, on the outside looking in. He's playing with Madison Bowie, which is uh, not really a good look for him. But uh, what what are your lessons? What can you learn, Lachlan, from these practice lines? Well, for starters, like you mentioned, Alex Chase on the uh, fact that he's on a PTO right now, and yet he is getting opportunities skating alongside Horvat and Pearson. It's voting pretty well for him. And of course, you know, I'm sure he's looking at that. He, he I don't know if he is maybe not him sp- specifically, but his agent at the very least is probably keeping an eye on that October 1st deadline coming up uh, for people to opt out of the season where, uh, if Travis Hamanick decides he's not going to play suddenly $3 million opens up and that could in, in turn be what gets Alex chase on, uh, a contract earns him a contract on this team. So the way that things are progressing right now, it's, it's still early. Obviously they've only still, it's still, we're still back with the first two games, uh, of the preseason. Lots more, I believe about five more to go, uh, before we get to the regular season, it's looking good for him that he's going to get in with that group. Uh, D Giuseppe is another guy who, you know, maybe was on the outside looking in. I think a lot of people had him penciled in for Abbotsford probably. And with if the, you can, if, you can, if you're watching the YouTube video right now, I'm doing the Italian hand gesture for G Giuseppe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing, it's, yep, it's not delivery. Go. It's let's Giuseppe. Go. That's exactly what it is. Uh, and you know what? He's, Nick Patan also Italian. So maybe he makes it, we have two Italians on the team. Like I'm down. It's, it's uh, Italian. It's looking not too good for Nick Patan right now though. Yeah. Hey, no, I, it's, I don't it's, think it's, not really. I, he he look Nick Batan is only is only probably going to make this team is make the team uh if uh by some very bad situation where Elias Pettersson is not available for game number 1 and so you almost kind of hope that Nick Batan's not going to be there for that first game but i mean if you want to give a little bit of uh a positive spin look they are looking for an entire fourth line right now there have been no updates on Brandon Sutter's availability uh, Tyler Mott is injured, but is working out with the team, but he's still not going to be on the ice for a while now. And that there was always that kind of that second wing spot open on the fourth line. It is possible that you see something along the lines of, say, a Justin Dowling centering Patan on the wing, maybe with Di Giuseppe. Uh, I think maybe the inside track probably for the Canucks is going to go to one of like Zach McEwen or Matt or Matthew Highmore instead over, say, Patan probably. 
but especially because uh, in that fourth line, you know, they're going to be looking for role guys, guys who can play in that penalty kill, guys who can uh, who can take a shift uh, on the power play if need be, or just uh, fill in in different certain spots that they might need. And I think they'll probably favor one of like Highmore for that, like Matthew Highmore in particular, probably for that role. But they're looking, there's going to be healthy scratch guys. You know that there's room for a 13th or 14th forward on this group regardless. So if you're, if you're Nick Patan, if you're DJ Seppi, you're kind of just trying to, you're trying to stay in the coach's good graces. You're trying to do everything you can to show that you're working uh, your butt off every single, every single practice. You're doing everything you can. You're paying attention you're making you're making sure that when they think when they need that next call up and they have they have a spot to fill you want to be that guy that the first guy that pops into their head yeah and i think another thing we can learn from these uh practice lines is it seems they're pretty gung-ho about uh about having jt miller start as a center uh regardless of if elias patterson comes back or not right like you know i'm looking jt miller is a center between connor garland and Vasily pod colson like that to me spells out that they're giving a serious look to JT Miller at center, which is interesting because, you know, when the Canucks acquired Jason Dickinson from the Dallas Stars and the whole Seattle expansion process, I think a lot of people, including myself, were saying, well, this is this is the guy they're gonna have as that third line center, you know, that that lot that role that they've really been missing over the past number of seasons, right? Like a legitimate third line center who can match up and take the hard minutes like uh, Travis Green likes from a from a third line. But that doesn't seem to be the case right now. And I honestly think JT Miller is going to be a third-line center for this team, even if uh, Pedersen comes back for the preseason, right? It, it is entirely possible, especially because when you think about it right now, as of right now, uh, the way the Canucks center depth was built going into training camp, the idea was that they were going to not, they were going to have uh, Pedersen, Horvat, Dickinson, and Sutter. Right now, Sutter's not here. And Ederson is obviously not without a contract. So in, in theory, you only really have two bona fide NHL centers at your disposal. Uh, JT Miller is technically one as well, although they have purposely kept him at wing for most of his time in Vancouver. Um, so if you're going to, so yeah, you kind of have to use them in a pinch here. I think, I think if say both of those players came back, it would be a very easy, quick move put up to put him back on the wing. But the way things are, they kind the Canucks are in a spot where they kind of don't have a choice. They kind of just need to go. Okay, we need we have a set we have two center ice spots to fill, and we have this this great player in JT Miller who we know can play center. So we're going to throw him there and hope it works. I think they're kind of just hope. I think if Pedersen comes back, it is possible that they keep him on the third that they keep him say as that third line and move Dickinson down to the fourth and really just just to make sure they have the the center depth locked down. Um, but I do think that it would be that it is possible that once Pedersen gets back, that it, it is a quick, it, it, it does go back to Miller being on your third and kind of, or on, on the wing, either on line one or line two, especially because you know how much success he's had in that role. And then uh, say calling up somebody or bringing in that, uh, that healthy scratch guy to take over on the fourth, on the fourth line. Yeah, and another thing I think we can learn from these uh, these practice lines, or just you know, so far in the preseason in general, why some guys are on this kind of main group and some aren't is penalty killing, right? Like a like a guy like Giuseppe might make the team solely because he can he can kill penalties, right? Like that's the kind of one of his calling cards. And even a guy like Matthew Highmore, I don't think he's had a great preseason, but he was on you know that last preseason game, he was killing penalties, and that's something especially in the in forwards that Canucks need right now, I think. Yes, they, yeah, like I, like I mentioned, yeah, Travis Green and his coaching staff really value uh, depth players, depth forwards who can fill just specific roles. It's always the case of, um, with a lot of NHL coaches, really, that if you, that they're going to need you to come up and be able to fill a role sometimes if you're on that, if you're one of those fringe players, if you do well enough in those, in that role, and you're able to be that adaptable in that role, Eventually, if and things go well, they might carve out a bigger role for you uh, in in a spot that you're more familiar with, in a in a role that you're more comfortable with. It's about being as versatile and as as you you want to give the the coaching staff as many reasons as possible for them to let you to let you come up and give it a shot. Because if you're one of the guys who you're like I'm a sniper, I'm only a sniper, and they don't feel that you can come in and be on the penalty kill or in depth defensive minutes 
you're not going to get called up unless unless on, there's a rare opportunity where a big name scorer is uh, is out is out of the lineup. And even then that's kind of, it's kind of unlikely because they might just, they more likely they'll just move somebody from the second to the first third to the second, and they'll just go from there. So yeah, your best bet. If you're a, if you're a fringe player is to make yourself as versatile as you possibly can make it, make yourself able to, uh, work, build yourself into a, into a player who's able to take on a variety of different roles, even ones that maybe you don't like, and maybe you don't like playing all the time, but that's going to be your best bet to getting, especially on this Canucks team with the, with the way that their forwards are built. Yeah. And for Ole Olevi, uh, I think he has a shot to be kind of a seventh defenseman just because he does again, kill penalties. Like we saw it out, out on the, in the preseason game, he does kill penalties. That's probably why he's, a. Uh, He's still with the main group, right? Like that's his saving grace is he does he does kill penalties, right? It's that and it's also the fact that Quinn Hughes is not here as well. Like yes. he is right now, he's got the inside he probably still has somewhat of an inside track. If I'm all your levy, I'm I'm holding I'm uh, messaging Quinn Hughes right now. Can you hold out a bit longer? I I need some more time to try and make my case here. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's the play. Maybe they're maybe, maybe Quinn it's Hughes a, maybe is playing it's an inside man. Maybe it's an inside good, man. Yeah. Maybe which, it's an inside if it man. Is, Smart call. That's a smart call by Olio. He's Levy playing 4D now. chess right now. I like it. it we're, we're yeah, it's it, the the Olevi's gambit as we call it, as we would call it. Um, <laughs> it's he is yeah, he is in a spot right now where like yeah, he can he has to be able to kill penalties. He's got to be able to pair well with the third pairing defenseman. He's got to be able to find ways to work with say a Tyler Myers uh, with a uh, w or with a Tucker Pullman maybe at some point or another. You just got to be able to. It, you, he's just got to find a way to get kind of back into Travis's, Travis Green's good book. He's clearly had a rough go to start the year. He's had a couple, he had a couple okay moments. I think in the second game, he was, Oh, he did all right. He wasn't, uh, he struggled a lot more in the first one. Uh, but overall right now, you're kind of looking at a, a situation where maybe like, or you're really having to fight with Brad hunt for that last spot. Uh, especially even today, like Brad hunt was playing with Tyler was playing with Tyler Myers. And whereas you Levy was paired up with Madison Bowie, who is, I think we would agree, but I think you and I would both agree that is he is probably not going to be uh, on the on the NHL group for much longer. Oh, yeah. He's probably on his way to Abbotsford pretty soon here. So yeah, you want to find you want to find yourself in practice getting opportunities to work along on a pair with another NHL defenseman. You need to be able to prove that you can keep up, and you need to prove that you can have chemistry with those guys. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna get to the Elias Patterson and Quinn Hughes uh, negotiations. In just a moment, just another update for everyone out there. But first, I want to talk to everyone about BetOnline.ag. As always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. With a new updated cited interface, even more odds, props, and contests, BetOnline continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Don't forget to use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. From football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, where the game starts. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for all the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle. And a great way to dream and it brings your live tv and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows all in one place that means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again and the best part is there's no annual contract so get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your tv together with direct tv stream you can learn more at directtv.com that's directtv.com Compatible device required. Content varies by package. All right. So our uh, daily, it seems like at this point, uh, Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes contract negotiation update. Uh, I was listening to the uh, Locked On Habs, Locked On Canadians uh, podcast uh, last night. Make sure everyone goes listen to this right after for your second listen. Uh, he, they had Sean Gentile on, who's uh, sort of like a national, uh, national NHL writer for The Athletic based in Pittsburgh. 
Uh, he's he's saying he was saying on the podcast it was more of, a, of an episode about the league as a whole. So you don't have to be a, a Habs fan to go let's do it. It's a it's a good podcast for every hockey fan out there. But uh, he was saying he thinks you know the Canucks RFA's are going to be uh, done before Brady Kachuk is. I think you know that's the other big RFA that uh, that's left out there. Obviously, we're a Canucks podcast where we're going to be focused on uh, PD and Hughes, but Brady Kachuk still kind of dangling out there for the Ottawa Senators to get signed. Uh, Frank Servali of, of Daily Faceoff uh, doesn't think that the Elias Patterson Quinn Hughes negotiations have gone really sour so far. They haven't got it to a dark place. He says that's not really a Jim Benning style, which I mean, you I, I can believe for the, for the most part. And uh, Darren Drager of uh, TSN really connected with uh, with CAA, their um, the Elias Patterson and Quinn Hughes uh, agency. He thinks uh, Quinn Hughes is willing to take six plus million. Uh, AAV on a bridge, which makes sense because that's just what uh, Rasmus uh, Dahlin uh, just signed for on a bridge deal with the uh, the Buffalo Sabers. So Lachlan, I mean, it still it still seems like we're we're in a we're in a holding pattern here. Where, you know, you're waiting for someone to kind of give in at, at this point. Yeah, that's a perfect way of putting it. This is very much a game of chicken where they're just waiting to see. Like, they're running at each other full speed you're, and to see who's going to get out of the way, which one is going to get out of the way first. It, you you mentioned the the Brady Kachuk thing with uh, uh, Sean Gentilly from The Athletic uh, on Locked on Habs uh, talking about, yeah, the Kachuk thing. The Kachuk thing is such an interesting at, uh, wrinkle in all this, particularly because – uh, the senators are not in a situation where they are like up against the cap. In fact, right now, if you go to their yeah. cap friendly, page, it's just a matter of Brady the cap does, floor. Does Brady Kachuk want to commit to Ottawa long term? They can give him like an eight or, by eight Matt Shabbat deal, like yesterday. They could, but he he just he just he just kind of dragging his feet in that way, which may or, be which may be yeah. more dangerous than the Canucks situation because I think both I think both you know Pedersen and Hughes would sign with the Canucks right now if they had the cap space like Ottawa did to go long term it's just a matter of kind of threading the needle uh so to say and, and with Brady Kachuk you also have to factor in the fact uh, the idea that you know if you if you know anything about uh the Ottawa Senators and the way they've been run over the last however many years it's that they don't like to give big money out to young guys generally speaking they are very they uh, and uh, there there is a there's a pretty heavy uh influence from the the guy paying the ch writing the checks that he does not like to pay a lot of money for those guys. Whereas the Canucks are in a spot where money, like you can, we can say what we will about Canucks ownership. Generally speaking in history with this ownership group, their money hasn't been the, it has never money. Hasn't been an issue. It's always except been a, for last yep, season, except, except for, for last, last season, season, which was frustrating as beyond uh, very, very frustrating. But Generally, yeah, but generally they're they're a cap team. They're always right up against it. They have never seemed to have a problem uh, with spending money for a product they believe to be good, and that it, and that is why it's kind of an interesting way, difference here with the way the Canucks are handling things. If the Canucks had the situation, uh, the cap situation that the Senators are in right now, they would, yeah, for sure, they'd be on the, both Patterson and Hughes would likely be on full eight year deals. Uh, maybe, you know, max amount of money you can possibly give to them, uh, in a, and, uh, no one would think twice about it because they would be, because, you know, they would be good contracts that would pay out, uh, very handsomely down the line. Um, yeah, but yeah, the Canucks are, are where the Canucks are at right now is very much a seeing who's going to give in first. Is it going to be the agents, uh, slash players who just want to get the deal done and get back to playing hockey or is it going to be uh, the management team that's under the pressure from not only probably ownership, but the, the whole fan base uh, to get their two superstar players back, back in the, back in the Canucks uniforms um, right now. If, I mean, if Quinn Hughes is asked, well, is fine with a $6 million on a bridge, getting them to that next RFA, I don't know about you, Nick, but I mean, if I'm, if I'm the GM of the Canucks, I'm signing that today. Like that, yeah, if that's easily. what you want, that's great. Perfect. That's a perfect contract. Yeah, no, a three by six for Quinn Hughes would be fine. I think, you know, you, you'll probably have to, you know, it's kind of punting the, uh, the, the deal down the road because you're going to have to give him a big pay raise when it's up because you're buying out a bunch of UFA years. But uh, no, yeah, like I'd sign three by six tomorrow. You know, they camp friendly. Of course, we've talked about this on the show. Camp friendly says 13 million. They're going to have 16 point something 
when uh, Michael Furlan goes on LTIR to, to start the season, right? So you're going to have 10, if you sign that, you have 10-ish million to play around with uh, with Elias Pedersen. Maybe you can get another bridge deal there. And you know what? Yeah. And if Hamannick decides to opt out, that's another 3 million. So you'll have 10 million right now, 13 million when uh, Furlan goes on LTIR. So I think, you know, I, I, again, we talked about the Hamannick situation yesterday. I think it's going to have to come to some sort of head. I think the deadline to opt out is tomorrow, is October 1st. So yes. a decision is going to have to be made at some point very soon. I would not be surprised. It's today, September 30th. If after we're done recording, that you know that gets decided one way or another or sometime tomorrow, again, at the very latest. So, I mean, yeah, three by six for, for Quinn Hughes. I'd sign that. I'd sign that every day of the year and twice on Sundays. <laughs> I yeah, I obviously I've said many times before that I I'm in the I'm still in the dream escape scenario where if say the Canucks got, you know, once you get Furlan's money off uh back, once you get if Ham and X money comes off the books, you look you look at immediate you have you have enough money that you could very realistically get both on long-term contracts for and not have to deal with the whole bridge thing as well. But you obviously have to keep in mind that with the a, a it's not a guarantee that Hamannick uh, ups out anyway. It's not entirely a guarantee. Although uh, we did hear, I believe yesterday, I I forget who tw- which insider uh, was talking about this, but uh, uh, Hamannick did ask the Canucks. Uh, the rumor is that the uh, Hamannick did ask the Canucks if he could play on vaccin- as an unvaccinated player, and they said no, and the team said no. Which good on the Canucks if that is yes. actually how that went. Not good only on for, them a, for not, a moral for not situation, right? And, like you yeah. should be vaccinated if possible if you don't have any medical reason yeah. not to be but also again if you're a canadian team you almost have to be 100 percent vaccinated you with how much have, you're traveling yeah. you don't really have a choice with how much you cr- travel back and forth across the canadian u.s border right so exactly. yeah like, again i think that hamnick situation is going to come to some sort of decision today or again tomorrow because that is the deadline yeah, I have a I have a bit of a bold prediction. I I guess this is oh, kind of okay. a let's hear it. I, have, let's I, have, hear it. I have a bit of a bold prediction. Not only do I think that um, if Hamannick opts out um, opts out of the year, not only do I think that it's going to be very quick in that time that the Canucks get uh, officially lock in their contracts for Pedersen and Hughes. I I also think uh, that you should keep an, that uh, based on what we've been hearing in the market lately i think we should keep an eye on jason demers as an as a potential replacement in that regard i think a couple people have been talking about that lately there have been uh i uh i believe it was rob a uh, rob williams from daily hive who mentioned that right now demers is unsigned willing w- uh willing to talk ball with uh teams that want to win that are in a winning looking to win um it's not as much about the money for him right now and hence why and he's not signed as of right now um, and the Canucks have shown a lot of interest in Jason Demers over the last however many years under under Jim Benning. So they might be and interested. He rejected in him the trade of the Canucks off. a few years ago, right? I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And now, but now he's in a spot where he would be willing to come. And if you are Vancouver, I think you see an opportunity to potentially uh, get all get uh, have your cake and eat it too here, where you get your forward signed, you get your two star forward signed, and potentially. Uh, a little bit of an upgrade on your defensive on that defensive right side. Jason Demers is, uh, I believe, has pretty good underlying numbers uh, in the past. He's done pretty well uh, as a defensive defenseman, which is what the Canucks need right now more than anything. Yeah, and for one million for one million a season, I I think that's I read the same report as well that he's willing to sign for essentially like a, a million million a year. Uh, it, it'd be probably a, a good fit because God knows the you know, the Vancouver Canucks need help. Uh, on that right side, like especially if uh, especially if Hamnick decides not to play uh, this season. But we're going to talk about the goaltending situation with the Vancouver Canucks in just a moment. But first, Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing number of makes and models, it's now possible for your local auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why do our often pointless or seamless, intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter? orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. With Rock Auto, you can save time and money. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. 
right? Locked on in their how'd you hear about us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Okay, Lachlan, so the, the Vancouver Canucks goaltending situation is, I would say it, it's pretty clear for the most part. This is not really much of a training camp battle, which is kind of contradicting the whole point of this of this section that we're trying to uh, figure out. But you know what? Like, it's still an interesting topic to discuss because for the first time in, in quite a while, I would say the Vancouver Canucks have a legitimate number one starting goaltender in, in Thatcher Demko. Obviously, last year, they... They at least the, the plan was to at least split a lot of starts with uh, Demko and Holpe. Obviously, by the end, it, it was pretty clear Holpe was pretty washed, so they decided just to give a bunch of starts to Demko. Obviously, the uh, the season uh, before that, uh, Jacob Markstrom was the starter, but there was concerns about injury, and guess what? It happened twice. It happened right before the, uh, the pause of the season, and in the bubble as well. We got bubble Demko because Jacob Markstrom uh, couldn't stay healthy, and I think for Thatcher Demko, this is going to be his really his first full season as the as a number one goaltender in the National Hockey League. So, uh, uh, Lachlan, you're, you're a goalie guy. You, your personal brand is goalies. You're, you're you love goalies. You're a goalie yourself. How sure many do. starts? How many starts would you give Thatcher Demko uh, this season? Because they have Yarholak. He has that clause for ten games in his deal. So he's at minimum probably going to get ten games. But how many starts would you give Demko in his first real full season as a number one starter? So this is something I've talked about quite a bit over uh, the last however many years I've been uh, talking about goalies at this point. Uh, and I talk, and I mention it all the time on uh, my other show, The Crease Cast, where we do like a lot of goalie stuff. Um, I've talked about the fact that nowadays we're, we're in a new era for starting goaltenders and for hockey in general, where... You, you, the days of playing a starting goalie 60 plus games a year is over in my opinion or should be anyway because not because they can't and they don't want to obviously goalies would play 82 straight games if you gave them to them the problem is that you're you see a lot of cases where goaltenders play so many games uh over the course of the regular season that come playoff time they're all re- they're gassed or the or it goes it transitions into the to the next season where they have played so much hockey over over a one year that uh they come into the next year tired a little bit injured sometimes like there's a, it puts a lot of strain on your body i think and i think a lot of teams have started to recognize that and have started going into this direction of playing this 1a 1b goaltender situation where there's you have your guy your main guy like you always do but you have a more than capable second guy second your backup is more than capable to take a lot of games and for the for the in Yarrow Halak, the Canucks have brought in a guy who has done a very good job of being a 1b like Tuka Rask i don't think uh, under any uh, I think everybody knows that Tuka Rask was the starting goalie in Boston for and has been for the last however many years, this year being the first that he's not. He's currently unsigned. He it, and Yarrow Halak was there to just be the backup. That was always the case. And yet, but Yarrow Halak played upwards of 30 games, I believe, every year, uh, every 80, uh, every regular uh, full year of hockey that he was there with the Bruins. And he did very well in those years. He did, he had a, he both had a very good save percentage um, and he won a lot of games. I think the Canucks are going to be in a situation where I think Demko is probably going to get, you know, Demko will get the majority of the games. I think it'll be somewhere closer to that 45 to 50 range, maybe a little bit higher, depending on how things go. But you're still going to see Halak play probably around 30. And that's going to be good for the Canucks because if you believe that you're a playoff team, which the Canucks seem to to, to firmly believe they are. They better be. You want, I'll say that. Yeah, they better be. You, yeah, you want Demko to be as rested as you possibly can because once playoff time comes, he's going to play every single game, and you know he's going to be that he's going to be in it for all of those. So keep him as healthy and as ready to go as possible for when that time comes, while still not giving him the bulk share of the workload. Okay, here here's my issue with that: is Yarrow like is how old? 36, 37 right now. Like he he is li- he's at that age, especially for a goaltender, where he is liable to fall off a cliff at, at any moment, right? Like thirty games for for a goalie that old is, is that something realistic? I, I don't know. I just don't know. And I know Yarrow Lack. Look, I'm a big fantasy hockey guy. I used to love picking up Yarrow Lack in a pinch when I needed a goalie start because, it, like you said, he was a very good one B. And he would always, you know, he would, he would have a good shot of him putting up 
a, a good performance where he lets in maybe like two goals on however many shots, gets a W, gets you a bunch of points. But I, I, Yar Holak in, in his mid to late 30s, like how well is his body going to stand up? And especially, look, and especially in, in a team like Vancouver with a lot of travel, it's not Boston anymore, but it's a lot easier travel schedule. How well is his body going to hold up? Like again, he is. I think a guy like Halak and a goalies at that age are liable to fall off a cliff at any moment. That would be my big concern with really relying on on Halak to get like let's say thirty plus starts. That is a definitely a big risk for sure. Um, but I think with the Canucks, the way that they're the way that they're they should be approaching this is it's kind of you can't you you can't know when that if that when or if that cliff is going to come. So it's kind of a matter of you gotta you got to kind of go with the risk here. You got to try and you got to give him as many opportunities to see where he's at in game. So far, he hasn't played a preseason game yet. I'm sure we'll get to see that sooner rather than later. Um, but the at the very least, what the way the Canucks are, what they do have going for them is the fact that let's say, let's say they give Holak a, a good share of starts in the early going and things just aren't working out. Then you do have Mikey DiPietro. You still have Mikey DiPietro who potentially Can you rely could come on DiPietro? Can you rely on a guy like DP? He literally hasn't think, played like one game all of last season, the last like 18 months. I don't I think, think you can got, rely on him. I, don't I think, think you, you need some seasoning. You, you, gotta, you may have, have to, but it's not a good situation. It would be not, not a good it's, situation. It's, to be it's in. not an, it's not an ideal situation, but I think you've got to put trust. Not a, you have to put trust in obviously Ian Clark as their goalie coach. Who's going to be working with them every day that he, is going to know these goalies in and out. He's going to know what, how many games to play them, how many, if they're, if they're coming along as well as they possibly can. I, th and I think you got to trust in the guys you have signed. I got, you got to trust that you, you got to trust Yara Holak that when he comes in, he's going to uh, give you the goaltending and the cleanup duty that you're looking for. I think, I think they brought him in believing that that's what he's going to do for them, that he's going to be that solid rock when Thatcher Demko needs a night or two off. And I think that bet is going to pay off all right for them. All right. Here's, here's a final question on the subject, Lachlan. F say the over under for Thatcher Demko starts is I'm going to set it at 55 and a half. Are you taking the over or are you taking the under? Oh, I'm going to take so I 56 take... or more. You have to start 56 or more for you to, I don't know if you're a big gambler, Lachlan. Maybe, hey, maybe bet online that AG can make this a prop bet. I'm, I'm throwing maybe, it out there for our bet on, from bet online. You know what? I'm I, I don't know. I don't know what their prop bet situation is, but I'm sure they've got some goalie stuff there. Um I would say I would take the over there. I would say that probably which would I guess put uh Holak around uh say that 20, the 20, 25 game kind of spot there. I think I think you you can suggest over, especially because you know, I think watching Demko last year, um, it one of my one of my hottest takes from last season was that had the COVID-19 outbreak not uh, put a huge, just uh, a huge pause and, and a wrench in the Canucks season last year. I th I honestly think that Demko is on his way to a Vesna Trophy final finalist spot. I think he was going to finish in that top three of Vesna voting. I think he was having that good a year. I think that this year he is going to build off of that. I think he's going to have a, I think he's going to, have his first full solid season and it's going to pay off in the way in in a way where he ends up being recognized as one of the best goalies in the NHL. Uh and I think that the Canucks are probably going to try and give him uh as many games as they feel they possibly can because like we've seen in the past with this Canucks team especially the way their defense is, they need their goalies to bail them out a lot. And I think that Thatcher Demko is a goalie who's clearly shown he's capable of doing so on a nightly basis, he can bail your team out and win a lot of games uh, through his through his play alone. I think you're going to see them give him quite a lot of games. I don't know if maybe it's the healthiest way to go about it, like playing him so much, so many over over such a short, uh, over an 82-game season. But I do think probably you'll see it, that number creep up over that 55 and into the 56, 57 age. Yeah, and I think Thatcher Demko is poised for uh, for a very big season, and if not that, at the very least, a uh, like you said, a very very busy season because he's gonna face he's gonna face a lot of rubber this season. But uh, I think we're gonna end the episode with uh, with this, Lachlan. Obviously, if you're a, a listener to this show, and maybe if you're not, if you're an out of town listener or what have you, obviously there's a few cuts at at Sports at six fifty yesterday, and we just want to 
share our condolences to you know Scott Rintoul and Karen Sermon. Now, obviously, it's tough. It's tough whenever you hear these new this news on Twitter, right? It's kind of just that existential dread of oh man, like it's someone else. It's just terrible news to hear about someone losing their job, and it just goes to show. Look, I, I'm as big of an anti-Toronto guy as you will find out there. I, I, I tweeted this out yesterday. It's just replacing local talent. And someone like Scott Rintoul, who I had on my previous podcast, just someone who's been in the market forever, to replace him with a, a, a Toronto, just a Toronto show, and it's not even anything, it's, it has nothing to do with anything more than cutting costs. It, it's just a slap in the face to local sports fans here. I'll say that very, very proudly. It's just a, a slap in the face to local sports fans. And it just goes to show you gotta, you gotta support local broadcasts and, and media sports media content here in, in BC, because it, it's very clear people, the people in the Toronto, the big wigs, the, uh, the corporate suits in Toronto don't really care. They don't really understand it. So obviously, you know, in, in Vancouver, we're very fortunate to have a great kind of podcast market. Obviously, this podcast and i hope you're subscribed to this podcast and following us on twitter and youtube and everything but a ton of you know great local podcasts and great you know you know radio shows on sports at 650 that are still local and live streams like Sakaris and price like just a lot of great local talent that you don't need to go to toronto to find your sports fix i don't think yeah for sure we make jokes all the time on like social media about how everybody and their grandma has a hockey has a Canucks podcast and how there's there's too many of them people like to say that all the time but I always say that actually there are as many there are as many there are as many Canucks podcasts as there are needed to be like I've always felt that you know no even if you don't necessarily agree with everyone's takes all the time on every show like the reason why so many of them exist is because there's always there is enough of a market that that many people are paying attention and want to talk about it. And I, so I will never, you know, judge anybody for what, who going in and wanting to start a podcast that they've just because they want to do so. And yeah, it's local. It's all local people just, or sometimes even, you know, technically local people who live far away, who just want to talk about their favorite team because they enjoy it. And it's something they, they get up early in the morning, maybe sometimes living in another continent to do. Uh, you know, it, I'll throw in as well, obviously, uh, obviously Scotty, Karen, and then, uh, uh, Adam Forsyth, I believe was also among the yes. cuts yesterday. My apologies it's, for uh, forgetting him. Yeah. Oh, don't. Yeah. We, yeah, we were going to get there. We we're going to get there. Of course it's, you know, obviously in this market we're we're still, we're still pretty sore over the 1040 thing that happened in, uh, February of this year. That was a really, that was a really hard day for a lot of sports people in this city. Um, and you know, but it has been nice in the last little while you're starting to see the rise of a lot more local people, a lot of people like local companies and businesses stepping up to support, uh, smaller sports, uh, media endeavors. And I, you know, I really appreciate that as both someone who is a media person and as a fan of the people doing those other media pro those other media endeavors. It's a, it's good to see. It's a very much a, like everyone helping out each other kind of thing. It's a very collaborative effort. I think with a lot of people around here, like you and I were talking about it yesterday. We were talking about how, you know, the rule, the, the, the golden rule of podcasting is that, you know, if you go on someone's podcast, if the, if you invite someone onto someone's podcast, you're going to go and do someone, yeah, someone pay else it forward. For them. Yeah. Pay it forward. It's all about paying it forward. And I think that, um, you know, we, we pick ourselves up. We all lift, we all make each other better. The more, uh, the more of us there are, the the better the entertainment and the quality of the, the coverage gets. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, hopefully we're going to hear back from all of these people, uh, very soon, uh, in new, in new, probably better roles. And, uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's, uh, I, I, I am fully behind the fact of, you know, supporting local support, your local shows, support local, media whatever you can do even if that's just by listening in every day or sharing it on your social media feeds that's just as much of a help as you can do yeah i agree 100 uh support support local there's plenty of great you know content out there in the vancouver market that you know it, it, there's plenty there's plenty to fill your appetite i think for uh, for connects content in this market from outside you know traditional uh media sources but that has it for today's episode of locked on connects part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Locked On Canucks and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We post full episodes of this podcast on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there at Locked On Canucks and follow me on Twitter at Nick Bondi. Lachlan Irvin is at Lock in the Crease. Again, big goalie guy. Uh, and make sure your second listen 
of the day is Locked On Bets. Betting on hockey doesn't have to be a guessing game if you listen to the new Locked On Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. I'm going to listen to it right after this episode because I need some picks for Thursday Night Football tonight. Get daily picks, blowout specials, the wrong team favorite picks, and Lee Sterling's Lock of the Day. Follow the Locked On Bets podcast brought to you by betonline.ag wherever you get podcasts. See you tomorrow.